Welcome to the 100 Master Coaches series featuring Master Coaches from around the world. Let's journey together on this 100 Master Coaches series with your host, Coach Mel, MCC. Brenda is a highly sought after executive leadership and mentor coach who is an accomplished business person with strong financial acumen. She is a well-regarded expert in leadership and talent development, very experienced in leading high growth and fast paced organizations and a mentor coach of professional coaches. Given Brenda's unique combination of an extensive leadership career and her leadership coaching experience, she knows how to navigate organizational obstacles and political situations to realize goals and maximize success. Now onto the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the 100 Master Coaches show. Today on my show, I have a special guest all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. She's none other than Brenda Baird. Thank you so much for coming on to the show, Brenda. Welcome. Oh, Mel, it's, it's, it's my honor to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're most welcome. We were talking a little bit before the show, and you did say that you're originally from Chicago. Tell me a little bit about Brenda from Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's really funny, Mel. I identify myself as being from Chicago and being from Nashville. But the truth of the matter is I grew up in a really small rural oh, town wow. about an hour, an hour south of Chicago in a little town okay. called St. Anne. Um, most people would never have heard of that. And then um, Nashville, I live in a little town called Monterey. Most people haven't heard of that either. So <laughs> I, I associate my, myself with those big cities. So people get a a general idea of what neck of the woods I come from. <laughs> and you know, same with me, right? I come from a city called uh, Pataling Jaya. But if I said that, they're like, oh, where is that? So yeah. I say I'm from Kuala Lumpur, originally Malaysia, right? They're like, ah, yes, KL. Okay. So, yeah. so I get you. They do say, though, no, no. Um, not to despise the days of, you know, or, or even the places of small beginnings, but yes. that there are great people that have come from the smaller yes. cities, the smaller towns, you know. Many great people. I, you know, when I was growing up in the small town, I didn't look at it that way. I could not wait to get (laughs) out of town right uh but now (laughs) here i am back living in another uh, really small town and love the quaintness of it and um Mm. there's there's a lot of a lot of good qualities coming from a small small town Mm, definitely yeah um yeah you know renda just wanted to find out just a little bit more about your story before coaching if that's okay sure Yeah. 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 Well, it starts in that little town of 1200 people. (laughs) And then I moved to the big city of Kankakee that had 14,000 people. And it was there that um, I I met my, my husband and then opened my own small business. Mm. Um, This would have been in the late eighties when cellular phones were just entering the marketplace. Uh, No one had them except for the very wealthy and they took up the whole trunk of your car, if you can imagine it. And so uh, I was a part of the Ameritech cellular boom in Illinois and uh, worked for someone else. um, And that person really struggled to see the value of female leadership within his company. And um, Mm. so I made a decision to start my own business and uh, we were quite successful Uh, We did cellular phones, and then we also did uh, wireless communications like two-way radios for public safety and 911 centers. And um, I got extremely burned out while I was running running my own business. And so I sold the business in 2005 thinking this would make me happy and life would be great. Mm. And I was young. I was only 42. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I can retire and life life will be great. And in about six months, after a couple of good vacations and a few good naps, it was like, gosh, if someone doesn't call me with a problem, I'm going to lose my mind. And so I I went back to work in a corporation, a global pharmaceutical company that was looking for the development of an L&D function. Mm. And I used my, you know, my expertise that I had gleaned from running my own business and developing those people. And we took it to the to this new position. And it was there that I got all kinds of certifications and trainings. And I learned about leadership. I I learned about teams. 
And I was responsible for hiring coaches. Mm -hmm. And so I would hire coaches for our high level management and our executives. And so I was on the other side of the desk in that got promoted and transferred to South Florida in, in a new position. And there was responsible for developing leadership and new manager uh, training. And what I quickly realized was this level above them, this regional level, they needed support because they could not help support these people we were building from the bottom. And our training was a bit remedial for them. So I decided I would explore becoming a coach and I could help coach them wow. to help these uh, lower level managers. So I, I did my research on coaching programs. I chose to go to the Institute of Professional Excellence in Coaching or IPEC as it's known. Yeah. And they have three residential programs. And I was in South Florida. So I went to Miami and it was quite glamorous and went through this first weekend of coach training and it forever changed my life. I was beginning to be burned out again in this corporate job. I was mm -hmm. really not feeling well at all. And what I realized in the coach training was all of this strife and stress and anxiety and pressure I was putting on myself was not what I thought, which was all the people around me were the cause, but it was, you know, my own, my own mindset was really at the core of it all. Mm. Um, and so I left my corporate job. I continued my coach training and graduated. And in 2015, my husband and I moved to the Nashville area in Tennessee. And I hung up my shingle as a certified professional coach. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And I say today um, that finding coaching actually saved my life because wow. I wish I would have had it sooner. You know, I really do think in the days of being a small business owner, if I would have had the knowledge to reach out to a coach, it might have not been quite the struggle that I was making it out to be and the burnout maybe not quite mm -hmm. as severe. I don't know. But I'm grateful today because all of those experiences have formed me and informed me into the coach that I am today. And uh, just last year, October uh, 22, I guess it was, um, I received notice that I had achieved my MCC credential. So that's kind of the epitome. I thought it was <laughs> the epitome of coaching, right? Congratulations. Uh, I was pretty... I was very naive in that because what I do know is it was just the beginning <laughs> of another journey, right? Of really um, trying to hone, hone your coaching skills and you have so much to learn when you're a coach. It's lifelong. So wow. that's my wow. story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That is like X number of decades in a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. <you>. Yeah. <laughs> You know, today I'm 62 and I look back and it seems about that fast. I mean, that's how whoop, all of a sudden I'm a senior citizen. I can't believe it. I don't feel like it, but yeah. <laughs> well, I just yeah. want to say thank you for coming in. Thank you for acknowledging all of that. You know, even finding yourself stepping out as an entrepreneur, of course, a decade mm -hmm. ago or so. It's a lot of steps along the way. I would like to just yeah. track back to the place where you were task i guess even encouraged to find coaches for your leaders you know at that point of time mm -hmm. um just curious what was some of the feedback at that point of time which is considered still early days of coaching right yeah um, right of these uh directors of these leaders right well, what were they saying when you kind of pad them with a coach you know and said oh we've we've got a coach for you how did they take it i'm just wondering yeah, I tell you the very early days of yeah. that endeavor, there were times when if you got a coach in this particular organization, I don't know if this is true everywhere, I have a suspicion it was, but yeah. if you got a coach in those early days, it was because you're you're going to get fired. This is like the last ditch. Oh, wow. if, you, if this coach if this coach can't fix you, no one can no, fix you, right? Fix you. Um, yeah, and and fortunately for for us at this company, we had a, a new HR, um, you know, chief operating people yeah. officer come in, and yeah. she really reformed those ideas. And so um, then it sort of moved into the place of a couple of different things. One is we're doing succession planning, talent development, and we see 
this level somewhere around the director level as somebody mm-hmm. who is on the succession plan for elevating to be a part of the senior leadership team. Yeah. And so to make sure they could make the transition from a more uh, tactical, uh, technical kind of work into a place where they could lead the business and be in front of the business, that's a pretty big leap yeah. in terms of the skills and talents. And so that would be one thing that um, senior leadership was looking for. And then there would often be times where we had high performers who were really doing well, but they were starting to flame out in the mm. fact that they were sort of getting things done, performing really well technically. They were leaving people in their wake or they couldn't build effective teams, or occasionally there were challenges in communication. And so they would bring coaches in and and ask them to really just help people get those things figured out. So Mm. big transitions and some skill deficits that, you know, they should have really gleaned from their training, but it didn't stick. And um, I think that was the big thing I learned, Mel, and all of it is that when you send people to training, Hmm. Uh, and you find that they need to go to the training again, there's something else going on there. And that is not about going to another training. It's about what's getting in the way of them actually doing what they know they need to do. So, yeah. Yeah. I often find the level of people thinking that training, which is upskilling, which is linked to um, competence is really important. But then there's right. this whole list of deeper things, our, you know, attitudes and motivations, our values and beliefs, right? Our identity yeah. of who we think we are. And perhaps in those places, it's who people want to see. So yeah, we right. leaders are often pressured to kind of show up in a way that is expected of them. You know, there's yeah. the the theory of the 70-20-10 formula in talent yes. development. It's a common, yeah. And, the, you know, 10% is books and training and things of that nature. Um, right. The 20% is feedback that comes in a variety of ways. And the 70% is on the job practice or, you know, really putting your hands on the work and doing doing the work. And so coaching to me falls into that 20%. Not only do you need your manager giving you performance feedback, but you need the feedback, not really feedback, but the reflection of coaching to help you understand what's getting in the way of you taking that 10% of learning and applying it into that 70% of doing whatever it is that you need to do, whether that's communicating, building team, Mm. executing, delegating, all of those things. So Mm. um, there's a reason why people say, oh, I have trouble with delegation. It's not that they need another training. It's something in, you know, their thought patterns are disordered to say, if I assign work to somebody else, they're going to get the credit that I think I deserve or something like that. So Mm. It's mm. a fascinating field. I, don't, <laughs> I just, I could talk about it all night long. <laughs> I perhaps want to, you know, dive deeper a little bit on your personal realization that 20%, I guess, for you mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. happen perhaps in a workplace and then you realize, oh, okay, if I did that shifts and if I continue being in corporate yeah i'm just wondering what encouraged you to to make that shift after you realized that certain things were no longer exciting perhaps for your the next phase of your life and what part of the burnout in my corporate job first of all the work i did in the corporate setting absolutely excited me i enjoyed it i loved it it was exhilarating it was Uh, working uh, with working amongst and with people that were quite triggering for me at that time. And so when I went to coach training, this very, the very first thing that ITEC does for you when you sign up for training is they actually prepare you to be a coach, (laughs) capital B, be a coach, not what, how to start a conversation, how to, you know, set up your contracts. It's all about this internal reflection that has to take place. And I'll I'll never forget this. There were two exercises. One was the examination of our who. Now I'm very familiar with what that means. And I know you are too, when they say the client's 
who, but in those days when I was in those first trainings, I had no idea what they were talking about, but when they described it about how our thoughts and the way we approach life and the lenses that we view life through are all colored by these life experiences we have. And some of these things are developed in the days when you can't make sense of what's happened to you. So you internalize it because it's yeah. easier to internalize it than it is to accept what's actually happening. I, it was like, you know, somebody cleaned my glasses. I was like, whoa, so I got a lot of work to do. I mean, it was yeah. just that, that switch. And mm. then we had to go through an exercise where in IPEC words, they call it a gremlin where really you're just naming your inner critic and it, and they call it uh, the gremlin. Yeah. And it was in that work of really understanding this internal dialogue and disconnecting from it. Those two particular sessions in coach training were quite powerful, mm. powerful enough that I returned home after that first weekend and resigned from my job. Wow. I was just like this. I I've got to heal is what I, wow. what I realized this wasn't about, I'm leaving these, this bad thing behind. It was, I got to step out of my life for a minute and heal. I got, I got too much going on. I, and I had had a lot of personal tragedy prior to the move to South Florida. I lost my father and uh, my mother-in-law and they both lived with us for a short time. My daughter got married and I was in Florida. She was in Chicago. So there was a, a lot going on and then just moving, picking up and moving from your childhood home to, you know, a whole nother place uh, where you don't even know where the grocery store is. It was a lot for a very short period of time. So, you know, I have to give that it's due, but yeah. uh, that's why I say, I think coaching saved my life because it was in those moments I realized I had more control over my life than what I was giving it and mm. that I could be happy. And what I had to do was get the distorted thoughts cle cleaned up. Mm. Then I could be a coach. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there are people listening here and they've gone through, I wouldn't yeah. say similar, but they've yeah. gone through their own journey. I do really think, Mel, that the yeah. core of it all, when I look back on it now, and I do look back on it fondly yeah. now, I wonder, had I been able to get to this work sooner, uh, understand what I understand today sooner. I, I may not have even left my job. I may still ha have stayed. And this is the thing I try to encourage my clients too. When you're in this state of distorted thoughts, do not make major decisions because unless your safety is in jeopardy, you know, a strong yeah. abuse or something like that. But yeah. if it's just, I hate my boss, um, that get some things straightened out first before yeah. you can make a, make a decision like that. Yeah. Get yeah. some coaching. <laughs> yeah. Get some coaching. Gosh. Yes. <laughs> there you go. There Life you go. Life changing. Yes. Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> it's amazing what, what you're sharing. I'm just thinking, obviously, you know, you've chosen the path, but if all those things didn't happen along the way, like, personal tragedies, those challenges that you were facing uh, with the move and everything, that whether that would make you choose something different. And we'll never know, of course. <laughs> but, never. Yeah, yeah, we'll never know. Today, all I can do is just, you know, embrace it and and bring it along with me as mm. part of who I am. And and it, it does inform me today. Uh, and when I say that, what I, what I mean is not to tell clients anything or to instruct yeah. them or give them advice, but it, uh, especially when dealing with executives, um, you know, you can hear, hear the BS sometimes in the, uh, in what, what's being said to you. So it does allow me for, you know, to, to push back a little bit when I, mm. when I know, Hey, that's not, I know that's not true. <laughs> I know that's not how it works. <laughs> and then you hold up the mirror to them right yeah, <laughs> and then here's, you're like here's what you yeah <laughs> take a look at what i'm seeing <laughs> yeah, you enjoying it <laughs> yes oh, how's wow. it working for you <laughs> yeah um if i were to work with brenda i'm coming from the angle that every coach is uniquely different 
and they bring in such amazing variety of themselves, their strengths, even the areas of how they would work with the client. That whole mm-hmm. uniqueness comes out. I'm just wondering what what are some of the words that describe your coaching, your coaching style? Yeah. Feedback that I have gotten through testimonial or other occasion to hear yeah. what others have experienced at yeah. me as a coach. One yeah. is one is a, an ability an ability to build trust and safety. They they would describe me as being trustworthy. Yeah. Um, we've been in my clients and I have been in some situations where confidentiality has been challenged, and we've been able yeah. to stay firm. And then I I think. One other way that they describe me is that um, that my utilization of direct communication. So I, I'm not afraid to carry a, an observation or bring forward an observation or yeah. to challenge them in a respectful way. But um, they view that as having provided them with an opportunity for growth. And so that's kind of the way that um, that I get distra- described. Mm. Um Thank yeah. You. And it's always a pleasure to be called trustworthy. That is one of my key values and um and connections. So um it that feels good to hear them say that. Mm. I, I once heard this statement that coaches are birthed because of their insecurities and they continue mm. to coach the people that reflect a part of them that they want to see transformation. Mm. So I'm just going to let That's that interesting. Yeah, sit yeah. with you for a bit and, and yeah. just wonder what your thoughts are. I yeah. have heard a version of that before that, yeah. uh, that I haven't heard it from a coach view, but I've heard it from when we are as humans triggered by other people, or we have people in our lives that annoy us, you know, that really what our psyche is saying is these are the things about you that you don't like. <laughs> and you're and you're seeing it yeah, in others and so it's a reflection of what you don't like about yourself and that becomes annoying so i would think then that could of course be true because we as coaches we are human and i suppose there is a mel a piece of it where you do wish you might have been able to do different or be yeah. different i'm gonna have to think about that that's a deep <laughs> thought for me i hadn't thought of that before yeah i just wanted to to connect it because you said something about how you were serving your clients mm-hmm. and and how you brought that inner person, that importance of trust, the importance of speaking uh, the truth, I guess, that the directness, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So important for you. I'm just wondering whether, you know, in reflection, that was because in the life before there was a different levels of, trust and trustworthiness in organizations uh, that there were perhaps encounters as well where these bits were not kept you know people weren't yeah. walking the talk with that just yeah that's very insightful very insightful and um, really is resonating with me because when I do think back to how I was raised and um I'm in my second marriage. So my first marriage, um, there was a lot of um, volatility and not a lot of trust. And there wasn't really opportunity for my voice to be heard in those relationships. So very well um, could be a really connection there. It really is insightful. Thank you. I should hire you, Mel. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for saying that bit. Not about the hiring, but you know, yes. that bit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you. Thank you again. You know, early days of your entrepreneurial journey, just wanted to mm-hmm. tap in on that. I remember my steps <laughs> becoming an entrepreneur. I thought it was easy. And then suddenly I realized, oh, I don't have a, a bonus waiting for me at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh so where's that holidays i'm supposed to be taking that long holiday right so so t- tell us a little bit about that shift 
Yeah, no doubt. It's really funny because I actually had been a small business owner, you know, in the early days. And you did say it, right? Of course. And so that was that was something. And I always thought, well, I'm just going to become a coach. I'm going to open a coaching practice, (laughs) and I'm going to just do it like I did it there. Totally different scene. I got done with coach training. I sat down in front of my computer and said, "Now what?" This was totally different than anything I had ever done before. I have to go out and, you know, and get clients in a far different way than I did, you know, in those, Mm. in the small business. And so it was a, it was a scratch your head kind of moment that I really had to answer. Now, what do I do? And so I did some things to experiment and, um, and they happened to work for me. And um, I got my first paying client and I charged her $50 an hour. And I thought I was, <laughs> man, I was yeah. on fire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it just continued to grow from there. And um, yeah, but the early days were the struggle of, I didn't become a coach to be an entrepreneur. I became a coach to help people. Yeah. I became a coach, I think, to almost heal in my journey as well. And so um, it is a different mindset, you know, to ask for money and the systems that you need to keep your practice running smoothly. And then as your practice grows, those become critically important. So those early days were just really trying to sort that all out. And I, I, I have to say, you know, you can get really distracted. And I probably spent a lot of money that I didn't need to spend on, mm. you know, how to have a six figure webinar and all these things that I thought would help me. Right. Oh, I'll do webinars and then I'll get clients or I'll do, you know, and so, yeah, it, it, it was Mm. just, um, it was a fun time of just, uh, trying different things to see if they could work. And Mm. until, until you get what I call your coaching mojo and then you find your coaching mojo and then everything starts to starts to happen. But it doesn't happen as soon as you graduate or as soon as you say, I'm a coach, people just don't yeah. call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like any industry, I guess, coming fresh out of school or university and then thinking, yeah. someone's going to hire me. I'm out there right, right. now. I'm putting myself out there. I got this beautiful <laughs> website. I've got set of business cards. They don't really, I don't really use business cards anymore, but that was the first thing I purchased was, ah, I'm going to get a business card. Yeah, yeah. none of that mattered. That Mm -hmm. was my reality. I really thought all these things I needed and I got to keep busy doing them. And they were just shiny object distractions. Um, Truth of the matter is I needed, I needed to network with people. That's what I needed to do. There you Mm -hmm. go. So let's go down your experience. Again, you said it earlier. It's probably different for the next person, for the next coach, right? Coming in. Yeah. What were some of the things that you felt on hindsight now? Oh, should have done that a lot earlier (laughs) and uh, left those uh, six figure webinars, uh, maybe, maybe to never. Or another time. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe to never or another time. Yeah. Use this money to find places to network with people. Okay. Um, this would have been pre-COVID. So um, what I wished I would have done in a, in a uh, sooner time was to realize that well, I needed to go where my clients were hanging out. Wow. Like wow. I found myself nice. sort of hanging out with coaches all the time because that's fun. They talk my <laughs> lingo. They make you feel good. But they aren't the ones that give you clients. So I, mm-hmm. I needed to find a place where my clients were hanging out and I needed yeah. to hang out there too. Now it's where do they hang out on social media? Where do they hang out? You know, what groups are they a part of? And and you hang out in there and then try to leverage opportunities that you run across. Yeah. Um, that six-figure webinar program, though, the one thing she did share with me that I will share that really did help was take my own contact list mm. and divide my contact list up into buckets. This is family. This is friends. This is work colleagues. These were vendors I worked with. Yeah. Craft an email campaign, not to say, please hire me, yeah. but to say, I'm in this new phase of my life. Here's what I'm doing. Here's how you can get a hold of me. If you know anybody who's looking for this, this, or this, please have them give me a call. That really is how I got my first my first clients. Wow. That's a gem that you just shared. You know, 
I do work with a couple of wonderful marketers through the years as well. And there were many little gems like that that were so important because one of them was to look back at your connections, look back at where you've come yeah. from, not throw away all of that and say, I'm starting afresh and new and everything because right. all of the things in the past have brought you to this place and they are important to reconnect with that and putting in the right perspectives that yep. not everyone's going to be your client. <laughs> yeah, but they might know someone who is going to be your perfect client. And these people know you, they care about you, That's right. and they want to help. I think humans That's want to help other humans. I mean, it's, yeah. I think instinctively we... You know, when someone says, I'm trying to do this thing and you can help me by just sending somebody my way, people do that. And so, yeah, to not reach out to your contacts um, is a wasted opportunity. Mm. Um, not to say, please hire me, though. If you sent them an email and said, I'm a coach now. If you need a coach, call me. I mean, that's <laughs> never going to work. Yeah. But to call them to say, "Here, here's what's happening with me right now. And I want you yeah. to know. If you can help me send someone my way, here's how they can contact me. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you have to do it more than once too. That was the other lesson. You have to send them emails more than one time. Like I mentor coaches who will be like, I sent one email, like <laughs> just one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and they didn't respond with, yeah. 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 And that word to me is consistency, right? How often we realize that, consistency in what we do for example even exposing ourselves to to new concepts to new yeah. trends or exposing ourselves with new learning even as a coach right it's not oh i've done yeah. it i've done my coach training that's it i'm, I'm not gonna learn new that's things right. it's that's every right. single day right it's like building a muscle in the gym right it doesn't just take one time at the gym uh, for five hours <laughs> yeah I wish it was that easy, right? That's a oh, reminder yeah. for me, by the way, not, not for anyone. <laughs> it's like, Mel, come on. <laughs> it's consistency. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no doubt. I, th I, I thought that way too, you know, becoming an MCC, my, my misunderstanding about it is once you get 2,500 hours on your log, then you just submit. Yeah and become go. an MCC. And I really learned the hard way that that is not how it works. But now that I'm kind of there, what I realized today is it's just the beginning because just exactly what you said is the ability to try new things, the open-mindedness to, to not yeah. get so stuck on any kind of formulaic thing that you learned in training and, yeah. and to just practice being present and mindful. That's a practice that never stops. I mean, you, you just have to stay with it to, to do it well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Just wanted to tap into that, that wealth of experiences that you've gone from corporate and then obviously to coaching and then, you know, last year becoming MCC. So there was many, many years of practicing your craft. Mm -hmm. um, what would be some gems through that journey that you probably want to share with some of our coaches here today? Yeah. From a personal perspective, the, the key takeaway of all of that is just keep striving to be a better human being wow. with all that you do, with every interaction you have, with so every true. task that you, um, that you face. When I'm, I'm working with leaders, I, I call it the give and get routine. You go to a particular scenario with the mindset, I'm here to get something. Oh, yes. You know, and in a coaching conversation, if I'm here in this coaching conversation to feel like I can provide value and you're going to say I'm a great coach or you're going to have an aha, that means I'm a great coach. It, it'll never happen. And mm -hmm. so just being a better human and being there to just give of your skills and talents. Wow. Um, I think the other the other thing uh, like uh, to tag onto that is that as a coach to not be so preoccupied with I need to bring value to this coaching conversation. If you have that in your mind, I need I'm here to bring value to the client. Yeah. I'm here to help the client fix it. You will not be present and you will miss it. You will mm -hmm. miss the opportunity to hear what you need to hear 
to ask the question you need to ask so they can fix it for themselves. And um, that's the, that's the ongoing part of learning. Uh, And then just getting comfortable with not knowing. I I, I heard that a lot in my early days of training and I never really knew what it meant, but um, today it has a new meaning for me. It may not be the same meaning for everyone, but being comfortable with not knowing in the coaching conversation for me means that although I've had these very robust and full life experiences and work experiences, my, that, that they are mine to hold. Yeah. They are not the clients. And the client is going to experience their life in their own way. And they are the experts of them. And uh, we've just got to get comfortable with that. We don't need to fix them or tell them or advise them or counsel them. They got it all within within themselves. And so mm-hmm. getting comfortable with that as a key, key takeaway. Wow. Thank you. I, I resonate with all of them very much. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know you do. <laughs> and, and similar to me, right? That whole not knowing was, was not easy yeah. because of the second point. I, I always felt that I needed to give <laughs> value add. Yeah. I felt I was trying really hard in the coaching session, right? Trying to, get them to a place of they say wow that was fantastic Mal yeah oh I feel so good as a coach yeah right yeah and you know not many people told me otherwise because we often have spoken to our executive clients in that PNC nature right and and I guess that's so important to allow that to come out in those conversations that we have as coaches with either our own mentors and our supervisors. Yeah. New coaches that are that are coming up, they ask for a piece of advice or something as they're getting their credentials. Whether you're on a credential journey or not, yeah. just having another coach that you can get some really solid feedback from who can be really honest and someone, I, this would be a more supervisory role, someone you can take, uh, take challenges to. Um, mm, mm. I had this strange experience just last week. Um, I don't want to speak too much out of school here, but I had a client who had a reoccurring dream. Mm. And as she was sharing the dream with me, it was a dream I had had as a child for years reoccurring. It was my dream. And I had to reach out to my mentor to say, this was so triggering for me in the moment. I had to say to the client, I just, I just want you to know, This is Mm. triggering for me because I've experienced a very similar dream. And so I'm a little distracted with, with what you're saying. And I just want you to know that if you notice something different about me, um, you know, this is why, and then, you know, a follow-up question with, so, you know, what was that experience like for you? Or what do you take that experience to mean for you? And, and so it is a, it is a thing where we do need to have support systems as coaches to reach out to people and say, Hey, this thing's happening. And I'm not sure why it's a Mm. growth opportunity. Yeah. (laughs) And thank you for being that direct to yourself as well, to be aware of what's happening within you and be able to openly speak that truth as well. Um, and, and that's you, Brenda. So I'm, I'm picking up on, on that beautiful coaching that you bring to your clients. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's really, it's really important. I wouldn't have wanted the client. The reason why I say that to the client is I, w- I wouldn't want the client to misinterpret it changes in my demeanor or yeah. the look on my face had to be one of shock when she started because <laughs> it's such a bizarre dream. <laughs> Um, yeah. I just had to say to her, I just, I need you to know this so that yeah. you know what's happening to me. Yeah. yeah. I think it's important to do that as coaches. Yeah, definitely. You know, coaching has, of course, shifted. I can't imagine yeah. myself being in the shoes of a young coach coming into this brand new world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we've, we've never had all those wonderful I call it coaching consolidation companies where they bring yeah. masses of coaches together to serve clients. Never saw that happen uh, in our years. Yeah. yeah I'm just wondering yeah. 
what do you see that future of coaching looking like? Yeah, I am so thrilled for companies like BetterUp and all of them yeah. because what they did was they elevated coaching and they socialized it in places That's where right. it needed to be socialized. I could have never done that by myself. And so they have made, you know, they've developed awareness around the coaching industry. Yeah. Um, they are changing. You know, it used to be they just took any and every coach they could get their hands on because yeah. their volume of work supposedly was so high. Today, yeah. though, they're much more particular about the coaches that they sign on. Those coaches have to have at least a PCC credential now because there's there's also an awareness being made about that. Just because you call yourself a coach doesn't mean you're a good coach. And we know just because you have a credential doesn't make you a good coach either and vice versa. But it's like having a college degree. It's that one way that people can differentiate you right. from all the coaches that I get to pick from. So I'm grateful for the for the agency work. I think it has a place. I think AI is going to trip them up more than it's going to trip <laughs> us up because I do think when we think about more tactical solution focused coaching that will eventually be handled through AI in some yeah. form or fashion. Yeah. Um, and it'll just continue to get better. But I think as coaches, we have to embrace these changes and work within them or we will get left behind. Mm. Um, but I say that and say, when you think about who hires coaches, how many people hire coaches, just think of it in terms of corporate. It's just, how many corporations are in the world that yeah, need uh, coaches? And then within each one of those corporations, how many high-level executives need coaches? Yeah. And then think about how many coaches are coaches. in the world. There yeah. is a gap. Of, uh, a we need gap. more coaches. We need need more coaches. So I'm excited even to hear that universities um, here in the U.S. are creating coaching programs and degrees so young people can graduate from college with a degree and a credential and go out and just right at the beginning, be, mm. be a coach. They don't have to have other careers, you know, first. Um, I think that's good news. Um, I, it's good for everybody. It's good for society, for a thriving society. And I think it's good for us as coaches. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Definitely, right? Um, and and yeah. what, what, what you're saying, I noticed I catch myself with thought of that gap that you were talking about, right? That vastness. Yeah. Um, I often <laughs> compare it with how many doctors do we need in the world? Yeah. And, and actually, there's still a gap for doctors and nurses in the world. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and that's why there's mm -hmm. a whole beeline waiting for a surgeon, for example. To, yeah. to help us in even in our physical health and, and even emotional yeah. health so that there is that huge sure. future huge future for coaching huge. and yes. the thought of internal coaches not just people who are um, set aside because you're a HR <laughs> that become coaches I realize that companies are now hiring people who are full-time coaches within organizations yes and yes. many more leaders are also equipping themselves to become coaches to understand when do I wear the hat of a coach in that conversation right. with my staff. So that huge growth of that acceptance in the workplace has, has been phenomenal. What are your thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, they just the door's just been busted, busted open. Yeah. And I think what this is just what I think in the future, what we're going to see is there's going to be a whole discipline of internal coaches within an org structure, whatever that yeah. looks like within yeah. organizations. There will still be a need for an external coach though, because yeah. internal coaches are, are good at, at managing and coaching people uh, at mid-level yeah. But when you're talking about the, you know, chief people officers or the C-suite, yeah. you really need some, an external person yeah. uh, for yeah. that building of trust, safety, and confidentiality, not suggesting that people in HR are not confidential. They are, but I also don't think I want to go to HR and tell, tell them what's on my mind. So I do think there'll be a new discipline that will come out of this. Um, and I do think that there'll right. still be a need for an external coach in within those environments. So yeah. future's bright as I see it. 
and uh, you know Shirzad Shaman Shirzad, tells a story. Shaman, yeah. Yes, he tells a story about the stallion, right? Who knows what is good? Who knows what is bad? And That's the true. story of the stallion is uh, the story of this. Like, who knows if this is good or bad? But you know, <laughs> there's something to learn. <laughs> Absolutely, every day I'm learning from this call as oh. well from your wisdom, Brenda. Oh. Really, thank oh. you. Oh. Yeah, thank you. In, in our closing you. moments for this call, what are your your closing thoughts for our viewers, for our listeners today? Yeah, if it is coaches that are listening, and I think it, I think it will be. I think the nugget of wisdom that I would like to share with them from my own MCC journey is: don't think that the distinction of MCC somehow makes those coaches that hold that shiny, polished, and better. Yeah. There is masterful coaching in all of us, no matter what credential you hold. And don't give up on that and just keep honing your craft and helping people. The world needs more coaches. And I believe that. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Brenda. I really appreciate it. It's been a privilege. Thank you, Mel. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Definitely. Well, this has been the 100 Master Coaches show today with Brenda and myself saying, wherever you are, stay true to yourself, trust the process, <laughs> and truly bring out the best in others out there. Till then, take care. Yeah. God bless. Catch you later. Thank you. You have been watching the 100 Master Coaches series with your host, Coach Mel, MCC. Brought to you by Catalyst Coach. www.catalystcoach.live We will be right back with our next Master Coach on the 100 Master Coaches series.